evaluation and survey creation. So as you know, um, you know, you are all program creators, you're magic makers, you're community organizers, you're doing incredible work on the ground. Um, but one of the most important pieces of doing that work is evaluating it to see what worked, what didn't, and how you can do better. And I know having been on your side of things um, as a program manager and creator, um, it's really hard to prioritize and make time for that when you're doing the work, right? You're like, I'm doing the work. <laughs> this is what I'm doing. Um, so my purpose and goal today is to really demystify this process and break it down so that you all feel empowered to take the tools we've provided and leverage them for your specific programs. Um, okay, I'm just going to move my little boxes here, my beautiful face, face boxes of faces. Okay. So, doo -doo -doo. so first and foremost, um, in the surveys that you all sent me, which thank you, thank you, thank you. Speaking of surveys, thank you for filling out the survey and telling me what you need today. Um, so a lot of you asked, you know, just what are the requirements? What is it that we actually are asking of you? So first and foremost, the arts and society evaluation requirement is that you evaluate your programs. That that's really it. That is the primary requirement is that you evaluate your programs. How you evaluate your programs is going to depend on your program and your needs. So we fully understand that each project is going to have unique goals, needs, circumstances, and we expect that you will build your evaluation tools to fit those needs, goals, and circumstances. You will be creating multiple surveys for different groups engaged in your project, which we'll talk about shortly. And then back to requirements, the one like true, true, true requirement is that we do want you to ask this very specific question um, and you get to determine where in your survey and who this, this question is asked. Um, but the question is, was art an effective tool for engaging the community about blank issue X? Um, and again, I'll go into more detail about where you find these questions, et cetera. But when we're talking about requirements, we got essentially two requirements. Evaluate your program, ask this question. So before I move on, any questions about that, about the requirements? Awesome. And I am, oh yeah, go ahead, Becca. I was just gonna ask, does that question need to be unchanged? Well, so we'll go over all of that. If you need, you are, we fully expect that you may need to adapt questions to fit, fit your group. I mean, issue X, like that could, you know, that could be a whole, a whole other set of information that you want to include. So, but really getting at that, um, that question was art an effective tool for engaging the community about X issue. That is what we want to get at. Okay. Great Thank question. You. And just so you all know, I am, you know, because I'm in presentation mode, I can only see so many faces. So please, for the for this part of the presentation, just holler at me. Feel free to unmute yourself um, if you're if you're if you don't want to do that, which I fully, un, um, you know, fully appreciate. Just jump in the chat. I've got Lee and Emma on deck to read your chat questions as they come up and let me know as they come up. So please just um, don't hesitate to ask those questions as they come. So why do we evaluate, right? What's the point? <laughs> so we evaluate to inform the development of your program and learn from what partners and participants have experienced. So, you know, it's the forest through the trees thing, right? We are so close to the work that we're doing that sometimes it's hard for us to really see all sides of it. So this helps us to learn from what those folks who are involved in these projects with us, what they are experiencing. This helps us also to get a clear picture of the impact that your program had on participants. Can learn where the impacts you intended occurred, where, uh, where they didn't, <laughs> where new impacts that you didn't expect happened. Um, so it's a, a lot about um, getting that clear picture of impact. And then of course, there's the funding and application side of things. You wanna have that data to share with your funders, help them to understand the impacts of their investment. And then to show demonstrated impact and learnings in future funding efforts. So having that um, evaluation under your belt for future applications can be really helpful as well. Okay, so the next question, and this was a big question um, in your surveys. 
who, who to evaluate. Um, so most arts and society projects are going to construct evaluation tools. An evaluation tool is just another way of saying survey. So survey, evaluation tool. Um, so most AIS projects will need to construct surveys, evaluation tools for four different groups. And the groups that we have identified are participant, participant audience, artist, and administrator. Now here's the thing, these are pretty broad terms, right? Participant, that's broad. Um, even participant audience is still, it narrows it a little bit, but it's, it's broad. So we fully expect that you are going to adapt these groups to fit your particular project. Um, so for example, and we'll look a little bit closer at the family theater company um, example that we are always referencing, um, but I wanted to point out that in their 2019 surveys, the groups that they surveyed were actors and stage managers, directors and playwrights, and production team and staff. So you can see how they broke up the groups that they wanted to evaluate based on what made sense for them. Who, are the, who do they wanna get information from? Who are they working with? Um, so really think about who you want to hear from, whose feedback will help inform um, if you are meeting your mission and goals, right? Who, whose um, input do you want to hear? So again, it's not about what arts and society wants to hear, the funder, any, it's about what you, what is gonna be important and valuable for you and your project. So you might not even have an audience group, like there might, that might not even be a thing. In fact, looking over family survey, I was like, oh, that's interesting that they don't have audience here. You know, they are a theater, performance group so you might you might think that they would have had that but they they chose the groups that were most important for them to evaluate and survey for their goals um, and that's these these groups here any questions before we move on about who we are evaluating anyone anyone this was something that came up a lot on the survey. So I wanna make sure that we're answering any questions you guys have about how to identify who those people are. Is anyone still stuck on that? Just a quick question. Um, yeah. Do we need to run, run by you kind of who our stakeholder groups are? Nah, we can no. Just make a choice based on what's best for our project. Fully trust you 100,000%. If you're not sure and you want my feedback and my input, I'm always happy to chat and talk it through with you. But again, you know your programs, your programs best. Our goal here is to create um, a broad enough kind of foundation for you to build off of, knowing that you are going to create what works best for you. Super, thanks. Awesome. Any other who questions? Okay. So next is survey collection method. So once you identify who you are surveying, you will want to identify how you will survey them. So you want to consider the capacity and attention span of the groups completing the survey when determining the length and survey mode. Um, so for example, artists you worked with um, may have more time to give you an in-depth survey than audience members who you've got, you know, for, for a split second. Like if you're trying to have someone, you know, audience fill out a survey at the end of a webinar, that's gonna be, you want that to be short and sweet because you know that they're not gonna, attention span is limited, right? Um, if you're working with youth, you might find that three questions is like, is about as much attention as they have. Whereas like your administrators who are really, really, you know, deep into this might be willing to answer a longer survey. So really think about um, that capacity and attention span of those groups as you're putting those surveys together. Another thing that came up um, a lot in the um, surveys was concern over um, evaluation fatigue amongst participants. So note, you know, just the concern that, um, and I know everyone in this virtual room has experienced this, right? Like, are you getting 700 surveys in your email every day? Anyone? Anyone? Yes. <laughs> We're all getting a lot of surveys about the, the webinar we just attended, the workshop we just did, um, you know, whatever it is that's happening. So we understand that there is a lot of that happening, and that's something that you'll want to keep in mind. Um, I don't have a clear and decisive um, 
solution to that, right? Like this is just kind of the reality of the times. I'd love to hear any thoughts folks have about evaluation fatigue um, and any advice. I, I imagine Kevin, when we get to you, you might have some thoughts too. Um, but that is just something that you will wanna keep in mind um, as you're putting those surveys together. And then of course, different groups may require different methods. So, you know, for example, a survey monkey link may work really well for administrators and staff, whereas a verbal kind of one-on-one -on -one more interview style might work better with youth. Um, so on that note, there are several different methods that you can, um, that you can embark on to do your surveys. Um, we've listed a few here, online platforms, of course, SurveyMonkey, Google Forms. Um, you can even create little polls within Zoom if you're having a Zoom meeting and you wanna um, you know, do a, a poll or something that way. Verbal collection, um, again, phone calls, in person if you're able to do it, right over Zoom like we are right now. And then of course, there's the classic physical surveys handed out in person or mailed um, and completed it by hand. So these are just like kind of the basic what we know, but again, we've got some brilliance in the room. So other ideas or um, thoughts about survey, met uh, survey collection methods, I'd love to hear what folks have tried and what they are experimenting with. Okay. I can go. Um, I just have a couple of comments, and I think I actually talked to you about it before, Lars. One of the things that we've had success with over here um, in Fruta is part of our master plan for our community is, and I think I'm going to use this for my, for my kids, for my students, um, just putting general thought-provoking sorts of questions on poster boards and then giving each kid some opportunity to use post-it note or a whiteboard to write their responses if they're not comfortable um, in a group setting, sharing their thoughts and their feedback. So that's a means that we're gonna use for collecting information from our, from our student participants. That's awesome, I love that. It's, that's uh, not only are you gathering data and feedback, but it's also really participatory and furthers that um, engagement. So love that. Awesome. Okay, I'm just popping up the chat here to see if I missed anything. Great. Okay. And we are um, running a little bit behind, but that's just, you know, time's a construct, so we'll do our best. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on to the toolkit, because I feel like the toolkit is incredibly useful. It's like super, super meaty and useful, um, but can also be kind of overwhelming. So let's talk it through. Um, so as many of you know, Arts and Society worked with Dr. Michael Seaman and UCD to develop this toolkit um, to help grantees create surveys specific to their programs. So the toolkit is, um, it provides a bank of questions built around six themes. Those themes are community development, aesthetic effect, awareness and action, capacity building, holistic economics, and overall satisfaction. So grantees will uh, construct individualized survey surveys using this question bank for each of their stakeholders. And the questions will be chosen and adapted based on your individual project needs and goals. Um, and again, just re-emphasizing re uh, this, your every project should include the following question in at least one of those survey tools. Was art an effective tool for engaging the community about issue X? And then of course your survey results are included in your final report. So let's look at the toolkit. Um, so I'm just gonna pull this up. <laughs> so the toolkit is really, this, this, um, this document, the evaluation tool builder, really just breaks down the process of using that um, question list it breaks down what each of these themes are about. So, you know, what the um, describes each of the themes. So community development, does your project foster community development um, no matter how small in scale or scope? So these kind of will help. Um, I feel like the breakdown of the themes helps just kind of contextualize where these questions are coming from. Now, you'll see, you, 
again, there's just some more instructions, a lot of things that we've already gone over here. Um, but if you scroll, scroll, scroll down, you'll see what is essentially a worksheet that you can use to help you as you're selecting your questions from that master list. This, you can use this or not. This is totally up to you if you wanna use this worksheet or not. It's, um, it's not mandatory by any means, but what you can see it does is it breaks it down by, so this is participant here, participant audience. And then for each group, there's a little section for each of the question themes and there's a place for you to list the questions you've selected. So this, I know, again, looking at this, it's kind of like overwhelming, like, whoa, there's like this whole worksheet I have to complete. This is just for you to use, should you find it useful, okay? We have um, a question from Sierra asking, yeah. how should we determine a goal for how many survey responses we receive? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so let me get to that in just a second. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna make a note just so I don't forget number of responses. Um, but let me um, while I'm still on this, I'll jump into the question list. Thank you, Emma. So looking at the question list, um, again, the question list is broken down by theme, and then as you scroll through, you'll see. The theme is then further broken down by the kind of the participant group or stakeholder group rather. So you've got questions for all, questions for participants, questions for artists, but you'll see here that it's a, a lot of the questions are repeated. I mean, this, you know, a lot of the questions that can apply to all will also apply to participants, will also apply to artists. So this is broken down in like such superb detail that you can really just go straight to the section that you're interested in and see what questions there are um, and find the ones that fit what you are looking to do. So we're gonna look at this a little bit more closely, but any questions about the tool builder and this question set before I, we look at a specific survey? Anything? Okay. So back to this. Do, do, do. Thank you all for waiting with me as I do all the things on my computer. Okay. So, um, and we'll have more time to talk about goals in just a second here, but. Um, when you're putting together your survey, you really want to know what your goal is. And again, you, you're, they're your goals. What do you want to learn? What do you want to figure out? So creating a good survey requires you to be really clear about your intended outcomes. What are you hoping to learn and why? And what kind of indicators will help you measure your successes? Be specific and realistic. Ask questions that will help you understand the direct impacts of your program and that help you to evaluate whether you've met your goals. So let's look at um, Family Theater Company's grant re uh, survey report from 2019. I just think this is, again, a really solid example. And I do see on my email now a lot of, um, uh, what's the word, uh, requests to access for these various documents. So don't worry, I will um, make sure to get everyone access to all of these documents when we're on our break. Um, one of those documents is this survey report, which is a really, really good example for you to reference. So again, you'll see here that um, that family broke down the groups that they chose to survey, the um, stakeholder groups that were important to them. And then they surveyed each of those groups and then in their report broke down the responses by stakeholder group. So we'll, we're just gonna look at actors and stage managers right now, cause that's um, at the top. But, and this kind of goes to, um, to the, the question that we had about um, numbers of responses. You'll see here that family listed the numbers of surveys that were sent and the number of surveys that were completed. So this is another really good thing for you to be keeping track of and to report to us. Um, it, just, it just gives us an idea of what the engagement was like. Of course, we love to see as many survey responses as possible and we encourage you to have um, you know, ambitious goals around that. And it's unique times and you each have unique communities you're working with. So you know what is gonna be realistic for you in terms of survey responses. 
if you worked with 10 youth um, and you think that getting half of them to respond is success, then, then right on, let's do that. Um, so you really get to determine what success looks like for you. And I'm happy to talk that through with you if you need support. Okay, so looking at this first question, boop, boop, um, or actually, yeah, we'll jump into question three. So I just wanted to pull some specific questions out to show you all um, how the survey, um, or rather how the evaluation toolkit comes into play. Because looking at the survey that family created, you can see here question three, the art presented or completed in this project engaged multiple senses, sight, sound, smell, touch, etc. And then they've listed the responses here, um, how many people responded um, along that scale. And then on the side here, you see I've written down that this question came from the aesthetic effect theme and is question AE4. So as you're going through that, that list of questions, um, these are the, this is how you can kind of pull out the ones that speak to you um, and then identify which groups that they're gonna make the most sense for. Question four, this project encourages you to experiment with art or media forms and techniques. Again, aesthetic effect, and that is AE9. And then here's the question that we, the, the required question. Um, so in family survey, it was question 12. And this one, I believe they did ask every one of their stakeholder groups, but you may only want to ask one of your groups. That's, that's fine. Um, was art, art was an effective tool for engaging the community about disability. So in this case, the issue at hand that they were addressing was disability. Um, and so that's how they phrased the question. And it was a question with a scale, but also opportunity to share responses. So you can see here that um, the respondents from family also shared, um, you know, some, some specific feedback that they shared with us here. So we went over a little bit. Thank you, Kevin, for being patient because I know you're you're ready to, to go. But um, this is this covers basically everything that we are really hoping to accomplish when it comes to evaluation in your surveys. Um, we are going to, after the break, go into some breakout rooms and um, do some more hands on work with our surveys. But I want to um, offer an opportunity for folks to ask questions right now if there's anything that came up. Any questions? Uh, I see a question in the chat. How many questions are in an ideal survey? So again, the number of questions that you ask in your survey is really going to depend on the groups you're evaluating. Um, if you're working with youth, um, and this is the example that I'm that I always use. You know, I've um, done evaluation with middle school before, and you know, definitely have found in my experience that a shorter survey for youth is best. You know, you wanna kind of just get, get to the point. Um, and then I also have really enjoyed doing one-on-one -on -one <clears throat> more kind of interview style surveys with youth as opposed to, you know, sending them a link. That's my experience. Um, but you might find that, you know, you want a longer survey for the folks that you're working with. Um, so really think about those people you are surveying and what their capacity um, and engagement looks like. Any Modest, other questions? You, oh yeah, oh, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, when do you suggest we start this, this process of collecting information? That is a great question. <clears throat> so you'll notice on the family survey, they, um, they these were survey questions that they sent out to their participants after the program had occurred. So it was sort of retrospective in that way. You could start surveying your um, you know, different uh, stakeholder groups at the beginning of your process, you can, you can, um, you know, do evaluation where you're kind of asking them questions throughout uh, pre survey, middle survey, post survey, you can also just do a post. Um, it's it's going to really be up to you and your project needs. Um, like, Dan, I mean, I know you, you all are like deep in it, like you're in the throes. So, you know, since you've already, you know, really gotten a lot going, then you might be thinking about, well, maybe we do a survey now while the project is in motion and then see how folks are feeling after. Just a thought, it's gonna be up to you what is gonna work best. 
Does that answer your question kind of? Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate your affirmation. <laughs> All right. Any other questions before we hand it over to Kevin? Okay. Um, so I am going to hand it over to Kevin Rains of Corona Insights. Um, Corona Insights has been supporting Redline and Arts and Society in our evaluation efforts. Um, and Kevin has some wonderful insights to share as well as some updates about how kind of zooming out, right? We are asking you all to um, evaluate your programs and then Arts and Society, we are also evaluating Arts and Society as a program um, to best you know, to best do this work so that we know that we are achieving our goals. Um, so I will hand it over to you, Kevin. Do you want me to pull up your um, presentation and be your clicker or do you want me to make you a co-host? Um, if you can make me a co-host, that would be great. Perfect. Da, da, da. Make you uh, adjust to my speaking style. I'm always up for the... Uh, for the challenge, but appreciate you taking the reins. <laughs> All right, are you are you uh, shareable now? Uh, let's see. Yep. Thank you, Kevin. All right, so Kevin is going to take it over, um, and then we will have a break after that. Thanks so much, everyone. Perfect, and I may uh, I may catch you up on time too because uh, I think I I might only need ten minutes, but uh, glad to take more. So. Um, as Lars mentioned, I'm Kevin Rains. I'm with Corona Insights. Um, no relation to the virus, and please refer to it as COVID um, for my sake. Um, but uh, we are conducting a capacity evaluation, which is a little bit different than, than what uh, Lars has been talking to you about. And I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about what those differences are and then kind of how um, I and my coworkers might uh, pester you in minor ways over the course of your work. Um, I wanted to give you just a, a really quick, like uh, one minute um, discussion of evaluation and, and the types of measures that, that we develop as a starting point. And when we think about evaluation, there's really four different levels um, that, that people often measure from. And you can kind of think of this as moving from what you do to what it eventually ends up happening. So the first is process measures. So it's, it's what you did. So it's, uh, as an example, um, and I made up a hypothetical project here. We held three events about the advantages of recycling. So it's what you did. It's the input that you had into your program. It's not necessarily what the goal of the program is. The, the goal of the program is not just to hold events. Um, the output measures are what happened as a result, uh, as a direct result of what you did. So in our hypothetical example, you, you might report 500 people attended our events. So we had an input, we had an output. Um, again, that's still not what we're, what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to, in this hypothetical example, change people's behaviors about recycling. So then we get to outcome measures, um, which is basically, did you achieve your goals? And so that's something that, uh, in particular with the surveys that Lars is talking about, um, that's one of the things we're trying to measure. Um, so in this hypothetical example, your outcome measure might be 40% of your attendees said they learned something new about recycling that they would put to use in life. Um, I'll mention a fourth measure, um, which has, become, has come of age more recently, which is impact measures. And that's really, you know, it, it's how is kind of a simple way to put it is how is society a better place because of what you did. So uh, in, in our hypothetical example, groundwater pollution declined because our landfills were smaller because people recycled because we held these events. Um, we typically... Um, don't go that far in evaluation just because there's a lot of other factors that can play into that. So, um, you know, you may have held a great event, you may have changed people's uh, attitudes and behaviors about recycling, and then uh, a strip mine came in to your community and changed groundwater pollution. It's not something you can control. So we often stop at the outcome measure of, of what we're trying to, uh, to uh, measure in our evaluations. Um, that said, there are also process and output measures that, that are necessary to report, and I'll talk a little bit about those as well. So that's my, my big picture evaluation lesson. Um, so if we look at the arts and society program, there's really five key players in this. There's the, the original funders for it, uh, not original, the originating funders. Um, they are 
funding Redline to administer this program. Redline is then administering the program to you all. You all are then working with artists who are then um, having interactions with audiences and participants. So everything that Lars has been talking to you about is, is what we would call a programmatic evaluation. And that is your goal is to try to figure out what impact are you making on the artists and the audiences in particular. So that's everything that Lars has been talking about so far. My firm is kind of moving upstream from that. And when you think about what the funders are trying to accomplish, the, the funders, they want to know the answer to this programmatic outcome question as well. But the other thing that they're interested in is capacity building outcomes. So they're going to be interested in understanding, um, did you as organizations learn something from this that you're carrying forward that might change how you operate in the future? So that's where I'm coming from. So whenever you see me show up, know that that's what I'm trying to accomplish instead of instead of the downstream outcomes that that you're trying to measure the other way. Um, so ag again, um, the capacity building is really uh, in an ideal world, this is a program that the funders would fund and then it would kind of gain momentum and become self-sustaining in the future that that the things that you would learn on this in terms of using art to communicate about social causes is something that that you embrace further and you spread the word and you build relationships and networks and, and that sort of thing. And so that's what we're trying to measure. Now I say this recognizing that, that I'm at risk of, of corrupting you when I say it, um, because we don't want you to, to think, oh, they're asking about this, so I probably should do it. We really wanna understand what's happening naturally. So, so recognize that in the evaluation that we're doing, we're not, we're not giving you a grade. It's, it doesn't make you look bad if you don't end up doing these things. They're just trying to learn, do organizations do these things or not? So, so it's just a different set of goals that's, that's behind the scenes. Um, so as, and as background, we, we helped with the other stuff uh, earlier. We're now shifting um, to the programmatic evaluation. We're now shifting to the capacity uh, building evaluation. And so we're going to be reaching out to you um, over the course of your time on this grant um, occasionally. And uh, per the topic of uh, survey fatigue, we will be trying to make it as easy for you as possible. Um, so what's going to be happening um, from our perspective is we have a number of things that are going, going on. And um, the first thing that we're doing is we want to collect some process and output measures. And frankly, this is just for the report um, so that, that the funders know that something happened, that they know that there was an outreach to a certain number of people um, and, and a certain number of whatever events or displays or something were held. Um, so two things are happening. And first, um, I suspect probably all of you have noticed that COVID has disrupted things over the past year. Um, you know, raise your hand if you don't think COVID has disrupted anything, but uh, uh, it slowed down our processes a lot. So we've got a little bit of catch up to do. So if, if you have already been active and are doing things, um, we and, and particularly Lara's will be reaching out to you just to try to retrospectively figure out what's been going on in the past. Um, going forward, we're going to set up a little, um, probably just a little data entry form that's online and quarterly we'll send it out to you and it'll have probably five to 10 different things that we'll, that we'll ask you to report on. And once we get those uh, defined in finality, we'll send them to you because our goal is that you know that we're going to be asking for them so that if you, if you do something in particular, you'll record that so it's an easy thing for you to fill in. So quarterly, you'll get an email from me or, or somebody in my company just saying, hey, would you mind going to the data entry form and just filling out these measures? Um, a couple of other things that are happening will be some facilitated conversations. Um, and the first of those will be with the funders. And that's something that uh, um, you will not be involved in that, but I'm just letting you know that it's, it's happening. So we're gonna be talking to them just to just make sure we understand their goals um, for the project from a capacity building standpoint. And then as you all finish up at the very end, probably something similar to a learning uh, community meeting, um, we'll do a facilitated conversation with you just uh, really to understand like what worked, what didn't work, um, you know, what do you think you learned, what changed about your organization, that sort of thing. So that'll be a one-time thing that happens next year. 
Um, and then we'll be conducting some questionnaires. Um, again, because of uh, the COVID disruption, in some cases we'll be um, asking people about past activities. Um, but on a quarterly basis, we'll send out a, a short questionnaire and this will probably be more like a fill in the blank, give us an essay answer um, type of questionnaire, just to ask you like what's been going on in the past quarter, what's working, what's not working, what barriers are you facing? So the bottom line is from us, you'll, you'll get a couple of emails every quarter that'll ask you to go on and uh, go online somewhere and, and fill some information out. And then next year, we'll uh, bring everybody together as a group to talk to you. So that's us. Um, any questions or comments or concerns? Thanks so much, Kevin. Really, really appreciate it. I, I feel like it makes, um, it just helps really to contextualize kind of the broader vision of the evaluation process um, to see that we are also evaluating, like we are also evaluating, we're all evaluating um, and we're evaluating so that we can do better. So we can um, have an even greater impact um, and do even better work. So that's what we're up to. Thank you so much, Kevin. Really appreciate you being here.